If the fabric of modern-day London could speak, it would pour out long-forgotten tales of the city. If you look closely at London's history, it would seem that every corner, crossroad and old building has a story to tell. This crossroad located in Shadwell, East London, is a perfect example. Often busy with traffic, and brightly painted with modern road markings, it appears very ordinary. But in December of 1811, this was the final scene of one of East London's darkest chapters. Less than 200 yards from this crossroad, heading down Cannon Street Road, is the highway, once known as Ratcliffe Highway. At number 29 Ratcliffe Highway, on the night of Saturday December 7th 1811, a linen draper named Timothy Marr, along with his young employee James Gowan, prepared to close shop. It was just before midnight. 24-year-old Timothy Marr was a former sailor, he had worked as a captain's personal servant on a ship named the Dover Castle and sailed his final voyage in 1808. By the time he returned to London, he had saved enough money to start a business and a family with his wife-to-be, Celia. They married and in April of 1811, they opened the linen shop. Four months later, their son Timothy Marr Jr. was born and the family were now enjoying the benefits of their new enterprise. A young woman named Margaret Jewell was a servant to the Mars, and on this December night, as Mr. Marr and James Gowan prepared to close shop, she was sent out to buy some oysters for a late supper. According to her own later statements, she walked out of the shop, turned left onto Ratcliffe Highway, and headed towards Taylor's Oyster Shop. When she found it was already closed, she retraced her steps, passing by the linen shop where she saw Timothy Marr and James still busy at work. She then turned onto John's Hill, where she paid a visit to the baker to settle an unpaid bill. At the time, it wasn't uncommon for shops and other businesses to remain open well into the night. For many, Saturday nights were the busiest times, as it was the day that most of the city's workers were paid. After settling the baker's bill, Margaret headed back to her workplace. It was just after midnight. By now, most businesses on the highway were closed, and the once busy street was quiet. On her arrival she found the linen shop in darkness, with the door firmly closed. She rang the bell and soon after heard footsteps on the stairs. She then heard a brief, low cry from the baby. She continued to ring the bell, but gave up after a few minutes for fear of disturbing neighbours. She remained there until a watchman by the name of George Olney passed by calling the hour of one o'clock. The watchman, not knowing Margaret's business, told her to move on. She explained the situation to him and he mentioned that he had seen Mr. Marr pulling down the shutters of the shop shortly after midnight. George Olney and Margaret Jewell continued to ring the bell and kick at the door, until a neighbour, a pawnbroker by the name of John Murray, emerged to see what the commotion was about. After the situation was explained to him, he told the pair that earlier, he and his wife had been disturbed by unusually loud noises coming from the Marr's residence, the loud scraping of a chair as it was being pushed followed by the cry of a young woman or child. Taking charge, John Murray went to his backyard and climbed over the fence dividing his property from the Mars. He easily gained entry through the back door and began to survey as best he could the dark and silent space. He found a lit candle which he took with him as he made his way up the stairs. Now faced with the Mars bedroom and not wanting to appear overzealous in his actions, he paused and called out softly. With no response, he turned and headed back down the stairs to the shop floor. It was then that he noticed the body of young James Gowan. His face had been bashed in, and blood still flowed from his deep wounds. 
blood and brain matter was reported to have been found on the wall, on the shop counter and even on the ceiling. In a state of shock, Murray stumbled towards the front door, where he found the equally mutilated body of Mrs. Celia Marr. She was face down, with her head against the door, jamming it shut. Managing to pass the body and get the door open, Murray rushed onto the street, and, barely coherent, told Margaret and the watchman what he had found. People, now roused from their sleep, began to gather outside. The news of murder spread, and the overexcited crowd began to push their way into the shop. It wasn't long until the body of Timothy Marr was found slumped behind the counter. Concern for the child suddenly dawned on the Mars neighbours, and a group of people rushed down to the basement where they knew the baby slept. There they found Timothy Marr Jr. in his cradle. The left side of his head had been grotesquely beaten in, and his throat had been cut. Upstairs, a search for the murder weapon had begun. No obvious one was found, but on the counter, completely free of blood, was a carpenter's ripping chisel. The news spread quickly through Shadwell and beyond, as more night watchmen were alerted. Charles Horton was the first police officer on the scene, and it was his job to search the home and examine the bodies by the dim light of his lantern. With no clear clues on the shop floor or in the basement where the dead child lay, Horton, accompanied by the watchman, headed upstairs. They rushed into the Mars bedroom where they found, resting against a chair close to the unmade bed, a heavy anvil-shaped iron mallet more commonly known as a maul. It stood handle up, and the head was smeared with blood and hair. It was reasonable to assume that the person or persons responsible were disturbed by Margaret Jewell's ringing of the doorbell and fled, leaving the heavy murder weapon behind. After returning to the still busy ground floor, Officer Horton and Watchman Olney were told about a set of footprints, comprised of blood and sawdust, leading out of the rear of the shop and into the backyard. Pennington Street still runs to the rear of this section of the highway, adjoined to it by narrow lanes. One man who was present at the shop, and who lived on the corner of Pennington Street and Artichoke Hill, exclaimed that he had heard what he described as 10 to 12 men, noisily rushing along Pennington Street in an easterly direction, then disappearing down Old Gravel Lane, which is now known as Wapping Lane, towards the River Thames. These men were never apprehended. Officer George Horton, murder weapon in hand, returned to the River Thames Police Office just as dawn was breaking. When he arrived, he found that three men had already been detained on suspicion of murder. They were Greek sailors found loitering outside the Mars shop. One of them had spots of blood on his trousers. After appearing before Thames Police Magistrate on the same day, they provided an alibi to prove that they had sailed from Gravesend that morning arriving in Shadwell after the murders had taken place. I could find no explanation for the blood found on one of the sailors. However, public house brawls were common, especially between sailors. The handling of raw meat and the gutting of fish was also a common reason for a sailor's blood-stained clothes. As there was no scientific way of discerning the difference between animal and human blood in 1811, these explanations were often satisfactory to a magistrate. The Greek sailors were the first of many men detained on suspicion of murder. Many of them, as you'll hear, were foreign men presented with little or no grounds to justify their containment. But prejudice was strong in 1811, and it didn't take much for an innocent man to be confined to a cell, sometimes for days, while he was questioned. The disgust and fear expressed by the public at the recent murders, especially that of a child, put the unorganised London police force under a great deal of pressure to find those responsible, and immediate suspicions fell on the already unpopular foreign sailors. This handbill, offering the reward of £50 for any information leading to an arrest, was quickly pinned to the door of every church and public house in the Shadwell area. It appeared that most of the public sympathy lay with the once prosperous and popular Marr family. Young James Gowan, however, was unfamiliar and had no known friends in London. In fact, prior to his death, it appears that he was known by a different name. It wasn't until the arrival of an anonymous letter, addressed to the Home Office from, quote, a distant relative, that his true identity was known. The letter stated that his name was James Gowan and not James Biggs, so at the time of his death, he was known as Biggs. Although the investigation began strongly and a reward was offered, 
the London police force was slow in their progress despite having three vital clues. The obvious murder weapon, the clear footprints and the clean ripping chisel. However, there were no immediate efforts to investigate the origin of the weapon or match the footprints. This relaxed attitude was made clear when Shadwell Magistrate Edward Markland wrote to the Home Secretary on Monday December 9th to outline the case. Included in his report was the line, We have no clue which promises to lead to a discovery. At the time a unit of low salary night watchmen were appointed to the streets of Shadwell. It was their job to oversee criminal activity and report it to the police and their magistrates. They all investigated independently, often failed to share important information, and accepted bribes to make up for their low income. Clearly this was an ineffective way to police any city, but for now the terrified population of East London was stuck with it, and improvements were not made until 18 years later, when the Metropolitan Police were formed in 1829. There were of course the famous Bow Street Runners, who have been called London's first professional police force, but they mostly patrolled the main highways into London. From what I've read, their involvement in the Ratcliffe Highway murders amounted to little more than offering a formidable presence. But during the investigation, one man did try to break the mould. River Police Magistrate John Harriet, feeling frustrated with the way investigations were being handled, took proceedings into his own hands, after hearing news of the most promising suspects so far. Aside from the Greek sailors who had already been cleared, the description of three more men, seen outside the Marsh shop on the night of the murders, came to light. One was a tall man dressed in a light-coloured flushing coat. Another was wearing a blue jacket with torn sleeves. He also wore a small-rimmed hat. No description was given for the third man. Infused by this, John Harriet issued his own handbill, offering £20 for the men's arrest. It was Monday December 9th, and it was the day the murders made national news. The description given by the Times on this day puts the crime's infamy in perspective. We almost doubt whether, in the annals of murders, there is an instance to equal in atrocity those which the following particulars will disclose. However, the sighting of three men on the night of the murders, and Harriet's independent offer for £20 for information, came to nothing, apart from a reprimand for Harriet for working as a maverick without prior permission from the Home Office. He apologised for his actions, but explained that he thought they were justified, given the magnitude of the crimes. Meanwhile, the bodies of the Mars lay in the bedrooms above the linen shop, where they had been since the crimes took place two days before. The body of James Gowan had by now been removed from the premises by his family, and given a burial in an undisclosed place. The shop had been guarded by a police officer since that night, but there were no rules in place preventing visitors, be they loved ones or the morbidly curious, from entering and viewing the corpses and their grotesque wounds. Such open visits to view the dead were nothing new to early 19th century East London. In those days, among the less wealthy population, a funeral was often paid for using the pledges left by these visitors, if the deceased's personal savings could not cover it. As the Marr family only had enough money to pay their creditors, it was down to these visitors, most of whom were nothing more than curious strangers, to foot the bill. In the interim, an inquest was held. It was tradition for this to be held at the closest available building to where death took place. So on Tuesday, December 10th, at the Jolly Sailor Public House on Ratcliffe Highway, the inquest opened. To begin proceedings, Surgeon Walter Salter, who had examined the bodies at the request of Coroner John Unwin, gave an in-depth and horrific detailing of the nature of the injuries and exactly how they were inflicted. The servant girl, Margaret Jewell, then gave her account of the night's events, followed by the Mars neighbour, John Murray, and then the night watchman, George Olney. The jury, after a short deliberation, gave a verdict on each of the bodies of willful murder against some person or persons unknown. On Thursday, December 12th, the Home Secretary, after much pressure from the press and the ever-fearful public, issued a reward of £100 for information. This move by the country's government had not been seen for half a century. Usually far more concerned with issues of national safety on a wider scale, it was virtually unheard of to offer such a reward for the capture of a murderer of four individuals. This reward was later increased to £500. 
There were many immediate suspects who were taken into custody, but all on questionable grounds and chiefly based on their nationality. Rather than giving details on every reported suspect, I'll explain the cases of note. On the night before the inquest, a man named Ashburton confessed that 18 years earlier, he had witnessed the murder of a Marine as he was returning to East London from Gravesend. He explained that he saw the man stabbed three times on board a ship. Ashburton saw the murder weapon, which was a sword, being thrown overboard, but he didn't know what happened to the body. The incident was investigated, and a Portuguese man by the name of Fanzik was held on suspicion. He was examined at the Shadwell Police Office, but it was decided that the police had more pressing issues at hand than an 18-year-old murder, and Fanzik was released. It was also around this time that the unresolved issue of the clean ripping chisel came into the spotlight. A carpenter named Cornelius Hart had recently carried out some work at the Mars shop, and when questioned, he openly admitted to borrowing it from a neighbour in order to carry out the work, but added that he had lost it three weeks before the murders took place. He said that he had contacted Timothy Marr and asked him to search the premises for the tool. He claimed that Mr Marr later told him that after searching the premises, no chisel was found. Hart said that he had not seen or heard anything of the whereabouts of the chisel until the morning of the murders. The carpenter was taken into custody and when faced with the tool, agreed that it was the one that he had borrowed, but pleaded that he knew nothing of the murders. After much deliberation and numerous character witnesses who attested to his virtue and honesty, Cornelius Hart was released. An obvious person who may have been able to explain its presence was Margaret Jewell, the servant girl, but she was never asked about it. Another suspect was a young woman by the name of Wilkie, who alongside Margaret Jewell had been a servant to Mrs Marr. Wilkie was discharged from her duties by Celia Marr because she suspected that the girl was dishonest. This led to an argument between the pair, which ended in Wilkie threatening Celia Marr's life. For obvious reasons, on receipt of this information, police considered Wilkie a prime suspect. However, given her small frame, they thought it impossible that she could have wielded the heavy iron maul and carried out the murders by herself. There was still the possibility that, if guilty, she worked with others. However, quick to protest her innocence, she gave the magistrate all the information she had, and she was cleared of any further suspicion. In fact, following her outburst and threats of murder, she had visited the Mars, and they had been seen to be on good terms despite the previous fallout. A man named William Knight, who had worked for the Sun Tavern Fields Gas Company, had on the morning of the crimes returned to his lodgings after work with heavily soiled clothing. He was greeted by a woman who also lived at the lodging, and she asked where he'd been. He told her that an oil cask had burst, spilling onto his clothes, and that he had tried to wash it off. Suspicious of his story, she told the police that she thought the stains may have been blood. Early the next morning, William Knight left the premises and hadn't been seen for a few days. It transpired that he had travelled to Portsmouth to collect his wife, who was unwell, and their young child. He was apprehended in Godalming in Surrey on the way back to London, and held on suspicion of the crimes at Guildford Jail. He was later transported to London and brought before a magistrate, he explained that he had left his lodgings unannounced because he owed the landlord money, and knew that if he had told them of his journey to Portsmouth, the outstanding balance, which he did not have, would be demanded before he left. He presented his oil-stained clothes to the police and denied any knowledge of the murders. I am as innocent as the unborn child, he exclaimed. Although cleared of wrongdoing, Knight was kept in custody for an extended time, because of the inconvenience caused by bringing him all the way from Guildford to London. Here's a good example of one suspect who was arrested with no apparent link to the murders at all. His name was Simmons, and an engraver by trade. He was apprehended based purely on his reputation for drinking too much, and doing, quote, many improper things. His landlord provided a satisfactory alibi though, saying that he had heard Simmons busy at work at his lodgings but Simmons remained in custody for some time. According to the magistrate, this was an attempt to scare him into sobriety and keep him off the streets in the meantime. A surprising suspect was brought to attention after a drunken conversation in a public house in Deptford, Greenwich, South East London. A man named Thomas Tyler said that he knew Timothy Marr's brother and that Marr's brother had hired six men to carry out the murders. 
When police questioned Tyler about the basis of his claim, he told them that there was no truth in it, and he was talking nonsense, something he often did when he was drinking heavily. These outlandish ramblings, he said, were made worse because of a head injury he had sustained during his time in the armed forces. Tyler's landlady came forward and testified that he was known for his insanity and tall stories. In reply, the magistrate commented that Tyler's reputation was richly deserved. However unreliable Thomas Tyler's story appeared to be, it may have sparked an investigation, because Timothy Marr's only brother was found to have been in a legal dispute with him over money, a dispute that Timothy won. This got the attention of the renowned and experienced Bow Street magistrate Aaron Graham. He was surprised at the apparent lack of motive for murder. After all, there was apparently nothing stolen from the property, and a considerable amount of cash was found during the cleanup. He questioned Margaret Jewell's story about being sent out for oysters at such a late hour. As it was approaching midnight, Ma must have known that there was a good chance the shop would have been closed by the time she arrived. Did Timothy Ma simply want her out of the way? Was he expecting a visitor who might cause an altercation he didn't want her to witness? If that were the case though, wouldn't he want James Gowan out of the way too? Graham began to suspect Margaret Jewell herself. He surmised that she may have lied about the story of the late night errand, and had left the premises of her own free will, because she knew what was about to happen. It was even considered that Mar's brother, or whoever was responsible, could have had a love interest in Margaret. Magistrate Aaron Graham was told that her woeful reaction to the murders was enough to exonerate her, but Graham disagreed. In his mind, the knowledge of a murder taking place is one thing, being faced with the horrific, bloody reality of it was another. However, Margaret Jewell was never pressed for information again, and in the eyes of the Shadwell magistrates, she was considered blameless. Timothy Marr's brother, on the other hand, was examined for 48 hours. In reply to Graham's theory, he said that he had never met Margaret Jewell, let alone been in love with her. A number of alibis then came to Marr's defence, all stating that he had been five miles away in Hackney on the night of Saturday, December 7th. On December 15th, 1811, just over a week since they were killed, the Ma family were finally laid to rest. The place was the St George in the East Church. The time was 1.30pm. The caskets were carried up the steps and into the same church that only two months before, the proud parents had stood for the christening of their son. Many people attended the funeral, among them was Celia Marr's mother and sister, who had travelled to London the previous Sunday to spend the day with the family, only to learn of their fate on arrival. Reverend Dr Farrington officiated the ceremony, and Timothy Marr, Celia Marr and Timothy Marr Jr. were interred in a single grave on the south side of the graveyard, where a tall tombstone was placed. In the sober surroundings of the churchyard, as the people of Shadwell watched three of their own being lowered into the cold December ground, they must have pondered about the identities of the people responsible, and the other unavoidable question, would they strike again? <laughs>